Well, good evening. We are thankful, as I've said before, for each one here with us this evening. Thankful to be able to be a part of the lectureship here. Uh, I this is year number three. So we're three, four. And uh, so we're thankful that we're able to continue uh, this, uh, this uh, event. Uh, we're looking at uh, tonight the idea of hold fast to that which is good coming from first thessalonians chapter 5. and so we want to focus this evening on looking at the importance of holding fast to what is truly good we want to begin first by looking at this idea about what it means to hold fast you know sometimes in life man has a tendency to let things slip away we're not careful maybe it's uh you know, if we think about some of the, the intentions we have early in life, we make some plans for things we want to accomplish. Even though we may have the best of intentions, some things do not always get finished and they do slip through. And we do not hold fast to those uh, ideas and those goals. Maybe there are things we'd like to continue that we feel we are unable to do. But there are some things that we should never let through our grasp. Some things we should never let slide through. If you think about that, that word, hold, that phrase there, hold fast. When I hear that phrase, I always think about, you know, some of those old movies about the pirates and things, and they would have tattooed on their hands, you know, hold fast across their fingers and things such as that. The idea was they were to, to hold on and to never give up and to never abandon hope no matter what whatever happened. Of course, on the sea, being on, on the boat for you know months, perhaps even longer than that, anything could happen. And so to hold fast meant they were to hold on and to never let go and never to give up hope. Well, there are no doubt things in life which we should never let slip through our grasp. Some things may, may slip away and we survive, but there are other things that if they slip from our grasp will be quite devastating. You think about John chapter 6. Verses 65 and 66. We have here a portion of this text. The Bible tells us there in verse 65. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They no longer were holding on to Christ as the one who they were going to follow after. They were going to just abandon him and walk away. And when we say disciples, we're not talking about apostles. Disciples are those who are simply those who are learners of him. That's what the word disciple means, a learner. But we notice here in verse 66, the Bible says, From that time, many of his disciples, or many of his learners, went back. But what did they go back to? Well, they went back, and all around they went back to living a life that had no hope. Because when you walk away from Christ, you do abandon any hope of eternal life. And so they went back and they walked, the Bible says there in verse 66, and they walked with him no more. It's interesting that we don't just have to simply have the idea that they went back, but the idea they went back and they walked with him no more shows that they stopped following him and anything he had to say. It wasn't like they went back and they said, okay, we'll hang on to a couple of things that he said, and you know, those were good, but the rest of them we're just going to ignore. And that's not what happened. The Bible says they walked with them no more, which means they no longer were going or listening or to considering anything which he would having, having has said, having said. And we find in verse 66 that many of them were doing that. You know, when we feel grip, when we, when we feel our grip slipping, we must remember that no matter how many may walk away. You think about there in verse 66, the Bible doesn't say exactly how many there were that walked away, but, but it simply says many of his disciples. Which I think there's mean there's more than just two or three. How many? We have no idea, but there's enough for the Bible to say that where many of his disciples went back. You think about that for a second. When others give up, when others hear the truth of God's word and they don't want to adhere to it, they don't want to make application of their own lives and therefore make the necessary changes, and they go back to, to returning to doing whatever they were doing before. Or maybe today, they don't simply go back in the world. Maybe they just leave the congregation that was teaching the truth. And they go somewhere that we can hear something else. That would be an example of going back and losing on a hope, right? Because if, in all reality, if we are attending anywhere, and we hear something we don't like, we can go somewhere else and hear something that, hear things that will never tell us things we don't like. That's not impossible. 
But those things will not necessarily show us the way to heaven. And we find in verse 66, the Bible tells us many, many of his disciples went back and walked with them no more. So just because many may leave, it doesn't mean they are right in doing so. So we should not let our grip slip because of someone else. It would be really easy to see a group of people, or maybe they included some of your friends, who get upset and they leave. It would be really tempting to slip right in and join them, wouldn't it? But that doesn't mean just because the group may include your friends or acquaintances that what they're doing is actually right. You know, the masses were leaving there, not the masses, but many were leaving there in verse 66. Remember, you keep reading there, the Christ turns to, his, to, turns to those who are still there and said, to you, are you also going to go away? Do you remember what Simon Peter tells us there, if you continue reading the text there in John chapter 6? Lord, to whom shall we go? The idea there was, where else are we going to go? But the rhetorical question, really, right? Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. Thereby, there's no one else I can go to. But these individuals in verse 66 did not want to, either they didn't want to care about that, or they didn't grasp that, or they were bending it completely, and so they walked with them no more. They were loose, they had lost hope. They were now loosing and letting go of their hope completely of any hope they had of eternal life. They were not holding fast to that which is good. We think about this idea of holding fast. We think about also a firm grasp. A firm grasp. You know, we have examples in the Bible of those who had a firm grasp on holding on to God and holding on to godly principles. You look at Daniel chapter 6. We find that a firm grasp on things that matter requires determination. In Daniel 6, looking at verse 10, the Bible says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, remember this in Daniel 6, the idea that they could petition no one but the king was what that decree was about, right? What that writing was about. Notice verse 10. Notice how much, or rather how little, it affected Daniel. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. It doesn't say he walked away, but he went home, right? Because now notice what else it says. And in, in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. You know what that meant? That what they decided that day, Daniel did not follow. Because in order to follow what that writing said, he would have to loosen his grasp on any hope he had, right? Instead, he held fast and he held to God. We find there in verse 10, he did not stop doing what he's been doing the whole time. The Bible says in verse 10, as was his custom since early days. What was the result in verse 16? So the king gave the command. You remember verse 15, they reminded him, you can't change the decree. You have your signet, your signature on it. That stamp, it cannot be changed. Verse 16, so the king gave the command that they brought Daniel and cast him in the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Isn't it interesting that even the king knew who Daniel served, and he knew that he served him continually? And even the king says there, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. We, if you continue reading there in Daniel chapter 6, you'll find that early next morning, basically the idea that the king does not sleep, doesn't eat, and as soon as the sun comes up, the Bible simply seems as soon as the light comes up, he sprints to get Daniel out of there as soon as possible. And Daniel was there basically just waiting for him, wasn't he? Because he had not let go of the hope that he had. He was holding fast to God, holding fast to his commands. He was praying to God, ignoring the decree back in verse 10. He continued what was his custom since early days, which was what? Praying to God three times a day. He did not cease from holding fast to God. Daniel refused to lose grip, to lose his grip on what mattered. A firm grip means we are not easily swayed from God. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, the Bible says there, here the Apostle Paul is speaking, he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about. 
tossed to and fro and carried about. He says, I notice, with every wind of doctrine. Because the longer we live, the, the stranger ideas will appear from individuals about what the truth actually is, right? I'm sure the Chuck and others who've been around a lot longer than I have will tell you they've heard a lot of interesting ideas, but they were not necessarily truth when it came to being agreed with the Word of God. You look at there in verse 14, no longer be children, I know it's tossed to and fro and carried about. You can't be tossed to and fro and carried about if you're holding fast to that which is true, to that which is right. Becomes like that anchor of the soul which we sing about so many times, right? That is steadfast and sure. And we find there we're not to be like those who are tossed around and easily, you might say, easily manipulated and easily persuaded to fall after ideas that keep coming down, sometimes the same ones, just with different names. Man holds on to what is important. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 20. We're going to look at just the first part of verse 20 here. He says that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. If you're clinging to someone, here being God, isn't it true you could also say that you are holding fast to him? Clinging to, holding on, the same idea, right? He, said, he tells us why there. He says, for he is your life and the length of your days. All that we have, all the hope that we have is in God. It's because of God that we have the ability to have our sins forgiven because he sent his son to die on the cross for us. God sent his son to do that. It's because of God that Christ rose again the third day. It's because of God that we have the ability to overcome any temptation that comes our way when we serve mind to because he has given us the tools. It is God who has shown us the way to heaven because he loved us. Everything we have is in God. Thus we find here in verse 20, For he is your life and the length of your days. For that he does what? He clings to him. He holds fast to God. He clings to him. Hold fast to that which is good. Hold fast to that which is good. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 24. It says, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. That's a great verse for us to remember, isn't it? Think about that last phrase. Consider what great things he has done for you. All of us here woke up in a nice, warm home this morning. All of us here, I'm sure, had nice, warm meals today. And unless things change, we'll all go home to nice, warm beds. In the morning, Lord willing, we'll all be back here. Why? Because the Lord has done great things for us. He blesses us, he provides for us. So long as we are those, as Matthew 6, verse 33 tells us, to seek first his kingdom, right? He says in verse 24 of 1 Samuel 12, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. Fear the Lord, respect, obedience, serve him in truth, and with all your heart, that is with sincerity. We give him our all. We worship and we follow after God with a sincere heart. Doing so, as he says here, as we consider what great things he has done for us. You know, not everything, as we have here before, not everything is good. Not everything is good. You know, we have a lot of things going around, a lot of little phrases that go all around today, be kind, but they're all being kind, but sometimes that's used in the context of be kind and be tolerant of other lifestyles, right? <coughs> no, love, love everyone. We should have respect for everyone. It's hard to love those who are doing things that are wrong, right? But we love them, we care for them. But not everything is good that we come in contact with, right? And everything we have that comes our way is good and we can accept it. Look with me for a moment in 2 Kings chapter 21. Look there at verse 9. Here he says, But they paid no attention. And Manasseh seduced him. If you look at verse 8 in the previous verses, they find their warning from God. And verse 9 is a result of their reaction is they pay no attention. And Manasseh seduced him to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. So the Lord had destroyed nations before them, that is, on their behalf, 
And what happened? They were doing more evil than the nations who that he has destroyed. They're worse than those who God had drove out. Why? They paid no attention, basically, to God and his word. And they were allowed, allowed themselves to be seduced to do evil things. That goes back a lot to Ephesians chapter 4 about being tossed to and fro, right? Because a lot of things are done in the name of convenience today, right? You know, the, the congregation grows so big, so now they're going to start having maybe the Lord's Supper being offered on a Saturday evening. And so it's a matter of convenience. Well, the Bible says it's actually unscriptural to do so, right? And the list goes on and on and on. And we find here in verse 9 that, that he, the Bible says that Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. That's a lot of evil, isn't it? For a nation to be so bad that the Lord drives them out, and then here comes Israel, and they're worse than those who were there before. They were supposed to be you know, God's people, and they're doing evil. So clearly not everything is good. You know, man too often goes with what he thinks is right. In Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 8, the Bible tells us, You shall not, you shall not at all do as we are doing here today. And it says what they were doing there today. Every man doing was doing whatever is right in his own eyes. He's saying this is going to come to an end. And those who try to continue to do so are going to be punished by God. Not everything is good. You know, we, there's a lot of benevolent people in the world today, in the church, outside the church, kind people who do a lot of nice things. You know, sometimes we realize that even when we, when we do nice things, we can still not be clinging to that which is good. Because in order to, do, to cling to that which is good, we have to cling to God and cling to His commands. Zeal is not everything. Kind acts are not everything. We must cling to that which is good, and no doubt God is that which is good. What is it that is good for us to hold? Well, no doubt God will, fall, will be the ultimate source of all that is good. The falling after the ways of God reveals what is good, doesn't it? In Psalm 119 and verse 68 says, You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Since God is good, since God does good, He basically tells us to do what? Teach me your ways. <coughs> Teach me your ways. You are good. You do good. Teach me your statutes. And in doing that, what would He, what would he be able to do? To hold fast that which is good, here being the statutes of God. Because God is the source of of good. He is the standard of what is right and what is wrong. He is the one whom we follow. We are told some of the, some of the good we are to possess and some of the good which we are to hold in 2 Peter chapter 1 in verses 5 through 7. It says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, self control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Right? Add those things to your faith, because they are good, to put it in a very simple way. Cling to those things which are good. And all these things we find here in verses 5 through 7 are not something we're going to add to our faith overnight. It's not like doing an update on your phone. It's going to take a while for us to properly be able to apply those things in our own lives. We'll make mistakes along the way. We'll sin along the way, perhaps. But we can correct all those things while at the same time, with the purpose being adding to our faith all these things diligence, virtue, knowledge, self control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. All things the world needs more of today from Christians, right? All, all things that our brethren around us need more from us as well. And no doubt, things which God wants to see in us also. That which is good, God and His Word. That is what we hold fast to. That's where we keep our grasp and our firm hold upon. Some lessons for us this evening. Holding fast what is good requires rejecting evil. It's hard to hold fast to what is right without rejecting evil. You know, Think about this for a second. Let's look at Psalm 101 and verse 3. When he says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. 
Now it's important to notice here in verse 3, it doesn't say I hate those who fall away. He says I hate the work of those who fall away. Now, that's a reference to he hates the choices and the lifestyle which they have chosen because it is clearly sinful, thus they have fallen away. He says I hate the work of those individuals. He says it shall not cling to me. Now think about it this way. I won't allow that to be, to be categorized and to be applied to me. I will not fall away and the same type of work, the same type of lifestyle as those who have fallen away. He says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. It's that determination to do that which is good and that which is right before God. We must want nothing to do with evil. It doesn't mean that we're not going to sin. It doesn't mean that we're not going to falter at times. But we, we know the Bible tells us how to deal with all those things. But the idea is that our focus and our goal and our eyes are always upon God and always upon His Word. Man cannot accept sin. Rejecting error is a requirement from leaders who hold fast to what is good. Look at Titus chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. In Titus 1, talking about elders and later even a little bit about deacons, we find here verse 8 and 9. It says, But, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober minded, just, holy, self controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. And here's the reason why for all those things that he may that he may be able by sound doctrine or sound teaching both to exhort and to convict those who contradict those who contradict are not those who have differences of opinion it's those who differ on doctrine and truth those who differ on doctrine and truth it's interesting we well recorded it for class tomorrow, but we were covering Romans chapter 14 for our class for OEBS. And Romans 14 deals with those things that were not of doctrine and truth, things that were specifically in that context, meats, unclean, and sacrifice to idols and things such as that. And the whole idea there in Romans 14 was not to pass judgment on those on others in matters of opinion. But that's not apply to matters of doctrine and truth. Opinion and doctrine are not the same thing. And so when we read here in Titus chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, we find here this last phrase, or these last few phrases here, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, that is by sound teaching, because he has knowledge of it, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Part of holding fast to the truth is rejecting those false ideas that are coming around us. And it's going to happen from time to time. We have to do our best to sin for what is right and to, to guard ourselves and to guard others around us as well. Holding fast to what is good means holding fast to God. In Hebrews chapter 12, in Hebrews chapter 12, looking at verse 1, here the Bible says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Think about that for a moment. We must give more earnest heed to the things we have heard. What are the things which they have heard? We could talk about it being the gospel. We could talk about it being uh, things that they heard there just in that context. But he says here in verse, verse 1, he says, he gives this warning, lest we drift away. So it seems that if we don't give heed, we don't pay attention, we don't hold it close to us, it is the truth of God's word, there is a very real possibility that we will, as the text says, drift away. That's why it's so important that we hold fast to that which is good, because there's plenty of things around us today that are trying to pull us away from it, right? Trying to pull us away from God, trying to pull us away from the church, trying to find things that interfere with our schedule, things that interfere with our priorities, things that interfere with ourselves, with our children, the list goes on and on. All in an attempt so many times, about say, by the greatest enemy we have of all, Satan himself, to, to try to encourage us to let the grip on God lapse. Because when you loosen your grip, how much easier is it for someone to pull you off of whatever it is you're holding on to? If you're holding on with both hands, it's pretty hard for someone to pull you off of that. But if you loosen your grip, you let go of one hand, you just hang on with one. You hang on with two fingers, it's not easy for someone just to slap your hand right off of it before you know you don't, you're not holding on to anything. It can sneak up on us 
with waves of opinions, with waves of, with waves of those around us who are doing things that are not right, trying to get us to condone and go along with their actions. Before we know, we're not holding on to anything. We're holding on to someone's hand that's not God. And they're going to lead us down a path that we wish we'd never start down. God is the source of all that is good. And for that reason, we must hold fast to Him. Psalm 63, verse 8 tells us, There my soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. Think about that first phrase. My soul follows close behind you. Think about a child walking down a sidewalk. You ask them to go, your child or your grandchild go for a walk with you. What do you do? You keep them close by your side, right? That's the image we have here with God, right? He is in front of us. We don't lead God. No, He leads us. And so we follow close behind Him because He is the one who is in charge. He is the one who directs us. You know, if you're walking somewhere, you're generally speaking, the one who is in front of you, in front of the pack, is the one who decides which way you're going to go. If God is the one in front of us, thus we're walking close behind Him, He decides which way we're going to go. And that's how we should treat it every day. We follow close behind God. He says there in verse 8, Your right hand upholds me. He guides us through this life. And we know He does this today through His Word. Think about this for a moment. We must be those who hold fast to God. We have a firm grasp on the hand of the Father. As we're reminded here in Psalm 36 and verse 7, when we hold fast to Him, we will find ourselves under His wings. Psalm 36 verse 7 says, How precious is your loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They put their trust, what? Under the shadow of your wings. That is, they put their trust in God. You know, Christ says something similar in the book of Matthew. When he speaks of those in Jerusalem, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, those who have stolen the prophets and, you know, killed those who have sent to her, I uh, wanted to get it together as a hen does her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Same idea here in Psalm 36, isn't it? God wants us under the shadow of his wings, which means we are gathered up close to him. Think about that for a second. If you're under the shadow of the wings of God, in this verse here, are you close to God? Yeah. So it's fair to say if we're not under the shadow of God's wings, that we're not close to him. Thus, if you're outside of the wings of God, as we have it here in verse, verse 7, the shed, under the, the, the shed of your wings, if we're outside of that reach because we're not doing what is right, we start like an unruly child sometimes, and we're going on a trip sometimes, they lag behind, we're not paying attention, and the group moves ahead, and they don't know where everybody else has went. They've been left behind. Same idea is pictured here with us and God. When we stop following God, stop paying attention, stop listening to Him, we stop listening to him like the father saying, keep up, keep up. <coughs> we find ourselves, we're no longer in the shadow of his wings. Thus, thus, we're no longer under any protection from God. We're no longer having those blessings we have from God because we're not close to him. And so we must remember as we think about this idea of holding fast to that which is good. In order to do that, we must be close to God. It is impossible to hold fast to God when we're miles away, spiritually speaking. It's hard to hold fast to God when we're not praying to Him like we should. It's hard to hold fast to God when we're not worshiping Him as we should. We're not worshiping Him at all. Because despite popular belief, popular belief, you cannot worship God from your home, on your television, to your computer. But we worship God together on the first day of the week, don't we? See, there's a reason why the Bible and God refers to, to us as children, right? You ever thought of that for a second, how we are called brothers and sisters, God the Father? Think about that language that's used. It's describing a family, isn't it? A family by design is meant to remain close together. But when we're no, when we're no longer close together, it's hard to know what's going on, right? It's hard to, to know one another as we should when we're not close together. It's the same with God. We don't, we're not staying within God's family. How can we know? How can we know what God you know, wants from us for, for deviating from being in part of that family? 
You know, we can go on and on talking about the importance of holding fast that which is good. But I think we have to realize that best, one of the best ways we can hold fast to that which is good is not only following God's word, but it's also rejecting those evil things around us. Because we live in a time where today the idea of refusing evil is not pushed upon us. Instead, it's the idea of tolerance and acceptance. And when we, when we start accepting sin, we start distancing ourselves from God. You know, the Bible tells us that God hates sin. He hates lawlessness because it's that which separates us from Him. Isaiah 59 and verse 2. So friends, as we close this evening for a first lesson, think about this as we close. Are you holding fast to that which is good? Because if you're not, it's not too late to readjust your grip and hold fast once again. Amen. It's time to have our, our prayers will be dismissed for a first hour.